Hey guys, Riven of Ash here. Today I will be looking at two clips, one sent by Dark Blood Souls and the other from Mirror's Cast. Dark Blood Souls sent me a video of his Soul Level 70 Freight Blade build. He is obviously an experienced player that knows the Freight Blade pros and cons and he is using it to good effect in this clip. However, he tells me that he has been having trouble with this build at meta levels and he would like to have my opinion about this issue. First, let me say this. It's hard to invade, especially at meta levels with only a katana. The Freight Blade doesn't even parry, which means that burst damage is out of the picture. Katanas and the Freight Blade especially are very good against single opponents and especially in a dual setting, where you can outspace your opponent and use the Freight Blade weapon art into R1 to outspace basically any melee weapon in the game, as well as having the Katana running R1, which might be the best chase down attack in the game. Against several opponents, however, Katanas are weak weapons as their swing doesn't make a wide arc around you, and you will have to work quite a lot for the kill by whittling down the health of your opponents. As for the build, Dark Blood Soul's stats are like this. He also tells me he's mainly a duelist, and it shows on his ring setup. He's using Lloyd Sword Ring, swappable to Red Tear Stone, Life Ring, Ring of Favor and Clorenti. Also, like a lot of duelists, he does not carry a parry tool. For me, the Sword Ring is very good for duels, and very bad for invasions, as in order to be at 100% health, you will a lot of times have to heal for less than Anastas heals, and thus heal inefficiently. Life Ring is okay, but I would probably prefer Havels and get heavier armor or more weapons, but it's a personal choice, I guess. Frayed Blade builds can follow different paths depending on what you want. You might want to accentuate the AR and bleed characteristics of the weapon, in which case a build like the Adam Barker's bleed build can be useful. This build is interesting in several aspects. Adam Barker tries to push the aggressiveness of the weapon to the maximum. Besides the 60 soft cap investment in dex, it also invests quite a lot on strength to squeeze a little bit more damage from the weapon, and also invests quite a lot on luck in order for bleed to proc faster. He uses medium armor and takes advantage of something most people don't know, which is that using a hollow gem on an item will boost luck by 5. That's what he does on his weapon art shield. Now, why use a shield on this build and not just two-hand weapon? Because it's much easier to go for the Freight Blade true combo of R1 into weapon art R2 one-handed. The timing is a bit more finicky if you are going two-handed. Adam Barker's build, however, has several issues. He cannot use heavy armor, thus better mitigating damage. He sacrifices a bit of vigor at 37, compensating the loss with life ring but losing a ring slot in the process, and his attunement is very low, and the Freight Blade can use a lot of FP, which will make this an issue. Also, the investment in luck does not have great returns with this weapon in my opinion. In this video I have 39 luck, look how many hits it took to bleed this guy. This said, the Adam Barker build is not bad by any stretch. It's a very fun build and, again, it's an issue of what you want to stress in that build. For me, I would go for this. Medium to heavy armor depending on which shield you choose. Prisoner's Chain, Hevel's Ring and Ring of Favor combo really well for lowering the equip weight. Some investment in strength that will allow you to increase your attack a bit, as well as allowing you to use a heavy weapon art shield like the Black Knight shield. Or if you want to go lighter, use the Eastern Iron Shield which has a great stability to weight ratio and then wear heavier armor instead. Using a shield will allow you to use the Freight Blade true combo more reliably, as well as having one of the best shields in the game. I will also invest some points in attunement, as now you can use Tears of Denial, which is a beast in invasions, as well as having a bigger FP pool to spam the Freight Blade weapon art. The Priest Chime can also be used for some life regen in the off-battle moments, but you will have to have it equipped in the offhand. As for the gameplay itself, I don't have much to add. Montages tend to show the best moments and that doesn't give me a lot to work with. I will say this though, a lot of these fights are 1v1s, or 2v1s where one of the opponents is weak, and that's what you have to do with a katana. Turn all invasions against multiple opponents into 1v1s. This highlights what I've said before of katanas being good in 1v1 scenarios. I also like how you use the Hunter Charm against Ultras, which is a good idea as the Freight Blade cannot do big burst damage. I tend to use uh, the Hunter Charms only after a critical, but it makes sense to use them more often out of neutral. Also, I would have used the true combo of R1 into Weapon Art R2 more often, and follow up with the Weapon Art R1 for Roll Catch, a bit like this.
Also, I know that the Weapon Art R1 does more damage if you hit your opponent with the blade, but I think you are overdoing it. Sometimes it might make sense to use the Weapon Art R1 just to hit your opponent with the beam. Mirror's Cast is also a YouTuber. He sent me a clip where he is fighting in the ringed city against a 4-man party. I will discuss the build now, as I don't have a lot to say about it. This is a true and tested sword and board dark build with a chaos dagger and a simple cestus. It looks like this. I would only make two alterations. Swap the great magic barrier, whose use is quite situational, for Tears of Denial, which is probably the best spell in the game, and has saved my ass many times, and swap the chime for the sacred chime of Filianor, whose weapon art will allow for passive healing even when the chime is not in either hand. Also, I would use one blue Estus to recast Tears and allow for the chime healing. This room right here can quickly become a death trap, as you can be plunge attacked from some spots and the ring knight will die very quickly against a team of four. Your priority here is to be cautious, and don't overextend. Never forget that in this area the herald knights are the mobs that really will challenge the party. In the clip you managed to get out, but you took a big risk, as if one of them stun locked you, you would have taken a lot of damage from the others. And now you get to the stairs of doom, which is how I like to call this area. This area is unique in the game, as you only need to control things and defend the mobs and the bridge, and the opposing team will gradually die, as the Herald Knights will do a lot of damage. It's a particularly strategic area, where the odds are very much in your favor, even against big parties. One thing that helps on a dark build, and in this area in particular, as the long range damage is very useful here, is to use lightning urns, instead of the black fire bombs. You can carry 20 versus 10 fire bombs, and they can do a lot of damage. Also, in this area, I always like to fight in the bridge over the stairs. It is your safe space. It has several advantages. First, if you are on top of the bridge, you cannot be plunge attacked, but you can plunge attack them. Second, because I am always using the silver cat ring in this area, I can throw myself off the bridge anytime things get dicey. If they follow you, probably they will take fall damage and risk fighting against the Herald Knights down there. Third, the easier way to kill a Herald Knight is to jump in their head. If you are controlling the bridge, this makes it much harder. That's why in this area I'm always trying to do a circuit. Get up to the bridge, fall down when pressured, and then try to get up to the bridge again. And now at this time the party starts to die, which is normal in this area because the Herald Knights do a lot of damage. So more importantly than, than uh, doing yourself a lot of damage to them, the important thing in this area is to control the party and, and survive for as long as you can. And the Herald Knights will end up uh, killing the party or you can just go for the finishing blow. So now one of them uh, falls down and this is an excellent opportunity and excellent plunging attack. So this uh, was, was a really good play and then the purple uh, finishes off his opponent. That's other thing that's important in this area if you're against a team of four. You can always uh, wait for, for reinforcements uh, for, for the second invader. Now a seed was popped on and that's one of the disadvantages of playing with a, with a HUD off. Uh, like you're doing, because uh, the seed is not apparent unless you are in a combat situation. So in this situation right here, I would probably have not engaged. I would let I would have let the, the party take the, the brunt of the damage. Uh, you take a lot of damage here, uh, and probably I would have gone up to the ring knight and tried to pull him to, uh, to the party because the seed is still active. But anyway, you managed to, to run away, so uh, you live to fight another day. Now this guy pressures you, and it was a good idea now to pressure him, because he was low on health. But this is, this is your mistake. When the first uh, Chaos Bad Vestiges hit, you need to back off and reheal. But instead you roll forward, and as you roll forward, he has the opportunity to throw another Chaos Bad Vestiges, and you, you, you get hit by it before you could drink. So all in all, I wouldn't have done a lot of things differently in this invasion. At meta levels, a small mistake is the difference between winning and losing, and if you had rolled back, probably you would have been able to win the invasion. That's it for this episode. I would like to thank Dark Blood Souls and Mirrors Cast for sharing these clips, and I hope this was useful for you guys and for the other invaders out there. Thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you next time.